everyone. This is the in-depth look at the song that I was listening to in the history series by Simon and Garfunkel called The Boxer. And before I dive in, I just want to say that if you've been following the history series, you probably noticed that most of the songs I'm listening to along the way, I'm listening as part of this learning exposure experience, but I'm not necessarily doing an analytical in-depth look at every single song. But when I come to a song in this course of learning and exploration that I'm doing with Carl, and I feel that that song really has something of substance to offer us or something interesting enough about it to, to validate doing a separate in-depth portion, I will do just that. And that's why I have chosen to do this with the boxer. First of all, it's a big difference from what I heard before in the little bit of history that I've been through so far. Secondly, it is simply musically very satisfying. And I wanted to take time to explore it a bit more deeply. That's what I've done. And now I would like to share with you what I have discovered along the way. After listening to this piece several times and spending time with it, I really feel like I would classify it as a true ballad style. Meaning it's that sort of storytelling folk style song that carries us along and gives us a nice feeling and a story that we kind of pulls on our sentimental side a bit. There's a lot of pathos in the text, in the lyrics, and, and it's something that we really feel like we can relate to on an emotional level. And a lot of that has to do not just with the music, but the lyrics as well. But the music supports and expands and enhances the whole experience. And it's, it's really wonderfully done in that regard. Now, as I was reading about it a bit, I ran across some interesting things about the chorus, um, which if you've heard it, I'm sure most of you have heard it. It was my first time when I did it in the history first listen, but the chorus is simply lie la lie, lie la lie, and so on. And I found out that it was originally those syllables were simply placeholders. They had no intentional meaning. And it just so happens that he couldn't ever come up with lyrics that he felt suited the chorus, and it just kind of ended up being left there as something to fill in the gap where the chorus needs to be. He had the tune, the instrumentation, just no, no words to really enhance the verses of the story, the poem. And it was interesting to me to read about that and find out about it. And it's interesting to me as well to see how many different interpretations various people have put on that chorus and on those syllables because it turns out that you can actually read a lot into them even if he never intended something in reality. A lot of it has to do with the power of the story that is narrated. Reading through the lyrics, we really get a picture of an experience, a life, a personality, and I'll dig into that a little bit. but talking about the chorus first. Some people took it to be referring to Bob Dylan because they thought that Paul Simon was saying that Bob Dylan was um, representing himself um, disingenuously. Others thought that because the song kind of and, and Paul Simon said himself that the song kind of has to do with the his experience, Simon and Garfunkel's experience with negative media reviews during that time period. 
they feel like the lie word was referring to lies the media was telling, others took it entirely differently and went into a whole long discussion interpretation about how the entire song they felt was talking about the experience of being conned. Not just anybody's experience, but us, the listener, each of us being conned. And they, they thought that it was, or they consider it to be something, like the sort of story that somebody panhandling or begging for money might tell to raise our sympathies. And then the chorus comes in saying, lie, 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 that's your inner self knowing that the story is false, but, but still it's such a, such a compelling story. And we end up being sympathetic and handing out money anyway, even if, even if we know the story is most probably not true. Even others have chosen to interpret it as referring to the never materialized promises which the young boy chooses to believe, referenced in the first verse where it says a pocket full of mumbles and, and broken promises and stuff like that. But Paul Simon himself said that it truly had no meaning. It was merely placeholder syllables for singing as they were developing the song and he fully intended to eventually end up with some more substantive lyrics to put there. He just never came up with that, and so he ended up leaving it. And he felt like, at first, he felt like it was kind of a songwriting failure. And then, in an interview later, when asked about it, he said, yes, I, I thought it was a failure, but the way people have taken hold of it and applied meanings to it to suit themselves. He said, I, I, I kind of like that. And I feel like, um, he said, of course, when I still, when I, whenever I sing it, I still kind of inwardly feel embarrassed because, because I didn't have anything more to offer. But at the same time, he felt like it really gave, was an interesting opportunity for people to apply their own experiences and their own views to this song as a way of relating to art in, in their own way. And so he didn't seem too terribly upset in the end, and he seemed to kind of enjoy the fact that people came up with various interpretations. Now, of course, going on beyond the chorus, um, it would be entirely unfair to do an analysis of this song without looking at the lyrics in general, because they are not only a big, big part of the appeal of this song. Musically, it's very satisfying too, but, but lyrically, they set the stage. And so we have to look at the lyrics a bit. And it's not only that they have the story to tell, but it's the way they're written. They themselves are very poetically, musically melodic so that they can stand on their own, completely unaccompanied by any music, more like a fully developed poem than mere song lyrics. And it reminds me of some of the poetic ballads and poems that I used to read as a child and in my um, elementary, middle school years where, let's say something like Robert Louis Stevenson or something would write uh, a poem where the words just flow and you tumble along with it and you feel a current and a, and a path of travel and all of that. And, and um, these lyrics are kind of like that themselves in their very own right. It's an enjoyable read. It's the sort of thing that doesn't take a lot of deep thought. But, at the same time, it does give us something to think about, because he has included elements and references and suggestions within the lyrical content that really point us to a broader picture. It's, it's incredible how, how comprehensive and all-encompassing this picture ends up being simply by reading the lyrics. 
And so we have to take that into account. And I like them. They're pleasant. And I like the richness of them. It starts, of course, setting up the stage. I'm just a poor boy. My story's not told very much. You know, we all know, we all know the lyrics pretty much. So I don't need to read the whole thing. But one of my favorite lines in the first verse is when he talks about, I've squandered my resistance for a pocket full of mumbles, such are promises, all lies and jest. It, it's so honest. It's so simple. A very simple expression of somebody who's just honest about the fact that still a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. I knew I was being lied to. I knew I was probably being conned. I knew all of these things and yet I wanted to believe and so I did. And then of course the next verse tells the story of how he left his home and family and you know a typical adolescent wanting to seek his fortune in New York City I like the line, in the quiet of the railway station, because it makes me think of a very small countryside railway station. This is not a big bustling city station. This is a place where it's deserted most of the time. And he's kind of running scared, laying low, seeking out the poorer quarters and so on and so forth where the ragged people go. And again, it's so simple and so honest and so straightforward. But that line, the quiet of the railway station, because very often we don't think of railway stations as being quiet. They're, they're noisy and there's a lot of activity and people and all of this. But here, there was the quiet. And that is what he found and that is how he made his way to New York City. And then we get to the third verse. He's now in New York City, right? And he's seeking his fortune and he he's trying to get a job. He's not even looking for any grand fortune. He just wants a simple working man's wages and job. Again, this is a simple person, a, a country boy who is just wanting to get a job and have his own life. Uh, but he gets no offers just to come on from the wars on 7th Avenue. And I ran across an amusing story that, that he himself told about this verse. Once he was singing it live, and he said that he stopped in the middle of the song to explain and tell a story of meeting a woman somewhere on the street, I don't know, who told him how much she loved this song and she loved to sing it to her child. But she didn't really like using that bad word. So she switched it up and called, instead of saying the whores on 7th Avenue, she switched it to say the toy stores on 7th Avenue. <laughs> and he commented right in the middle of his concert. He's like, he said, I think that's a better line anyway. It was just amusing to me. Again, an example, which if we're going back to the whole idea of the history of rock and all of that, how sometimes a piece of music is very, perhaps even provocative, maybe not even intentionally so, it's just honest, whether it's a cultural style or a new musical quality or lyrics or something. And then, as Carl was saying along the way, many times these were picked up and sanitized to make it more acceptable for a broader audience. And this is just another one of those little moments where, yeah, somebody wanted to sing it to their child. For whatever reason, she didn't want to use that word. Switch it up. Toy stores. <laughs> I found it interesting. And then, after that verse, there is... Another verse which, if you listen to live versions of the song, you'll hear it more often. It is not in the studio version which I did my first listen to, but I found it later and I appreciated it. 
I guess the reason it wasn't put in the studio version is because they needed an instrumental break. And so aesthetically, musically, it was more pleasing to have a little instrumental break rather than yet another verse, because this song has quite a few verses to it. But it talks about how the years pass by and we get older and it's not unusual, it isn't strange. In fact, maybe I'll read it just because I don't know how many of you have heard it. It says, now the years are rolling by me. They're rocking evenly. I'm older than I once was and younger than I'll be. That's not unusual. No, it isn't strange. After changes upon changes, we are more or less the same. And this idea of getting older and yet also getting younger and changes and changes, we are more or less the same. It stood out to me because as we go through this story, we understand that this person has get, taken quite a few hard knocks, never really become successful. But at the same time, we understand that they are never their spirit is never completely broken. Yes, they're beaten down. They're not particularly highly ambitious, not the go-getter type, but they're still kind of the same that they always were. Maybe changed on the surface, some different, different things have come along, and yet at, at their core, mostly the same. And I thought that was a very sweet reflection on the progress of life that happens to a lot of us. And um, hopefully many of us will never get to the point, hopefully none of us will never get to the point where our spirits are completely crushed. But, but we can find in ourselves that somewhere inside we are still more or less the same. There's still something to rise up and give another attempt. And then of course, just after that comes the verse where it's talking about laying out my winter clothes and wishing I was gone from New York City where the winters to where the winters aren't bleeding me. And in this moment, the kind of the syntax and the organization of the lyrics breaks down a bit. It becomes these little f sentence fragments aren't bleeding me, leading me going home. It's as if this person is trying to prepare for this journey and is kind of trying to collect his thoughts and he's a little bit disturbed. It's in the lyrics, the poetry of the lyrics themselves. And it's a very poignant moment there that I find. And then finally the last verse, which is absolutely beautiful to me where it talks about the clearing, the boxer standing in the clearing. Um, he's a fighter by his trade. Um, he carries all the marks of all the scars and blows he's taken. And then he cries out in his anger and in his shame, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. But the fighter still remains. He is still just as sensitive, as impressionable, as human, as he was when he started out as a poor boy leaving the train station. He still experiences anger and shame and recognizes that he's never really broken through. But at the same time, there is something of a sturdy quality in him, something incredibly resilient. And so in spite of saying, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, yet the fighter in him still exists. And perhaps that is what the absent verse is talking about. We are more or less the same. He's still not a highly successful person, probably never will be for whatever reason. Maybe it's Maybe it's fortune, maybe it's chance, maybe it's character traits, whatever. But he still has something in him that makes him get up every morning and try again. It definitely feels like a very 
American story, very American in its portrayal of a simple everyday man, full of hope, who, no matter what hard knocks he comes up against, he's perpetually optimistic. Even more than that, he just is not the type to let his spirit be crushed. I don't know if I would even say that he refuses or fights the depressing elements of his life. It's just not his nature. And so no matter how bleak the outlook, he still is hopeful. He still gets up and tries again because, hey, it's America, right? I mean, there's always a chance. And the music feels just right for this message. It's a beautiful flowing ballad, very smooth in its melody, very simple in its harmony. It's not trying to be some intellectual genius. It's not trying to do anything grand or or impressive. It's resembling the type of music that we find in traditional folk songs. And not only that, the performance, Simon and Garfunkel themselves, give it a laid-back quality. It's not a hustling piece of music, just like the character within the story doesn't seem to be that type of personality either. It has a sort of an air of resignation, not like someone that gets up and, and forces or insists or fights for success in an aggressive manner, but rather as the poetry portrays, so also the music says, it's someone who gets up each day and simply tries again. Patient, consistent, hopeful, maybe never breaking through, but developing more and more fully in the same vein, becoming stronger, taking the blows. The character toughens, although it never becomes hard, it's always sensitive. And as the instrumentation becomes more powerful, as the song progresses, the bass harmonica and the brass come in and punctuate and the drums strike their blows. We hear in the music this poor boy maturing into a fighter. Not necessarily a winner, as we often think of winners, but a fighter nonetheless, one who endures, who perseveres, who gets up and takes it again and again, or as the last word of the song is, he remains. Technically, the musical feature that helps to set the stage for this piece of art is the, I, I would say it's the melodic design. If we look at its shape, we find that, first of all, it rarely travels in large leaps between the notes. And it likes to move in a single continuous direction for as long as possible. It follows a tried and true contour, what I call the rainbow shape. And I'll demonstrate that on the harp in just a moment, but I also want to add, it has, within this rainbow shape, it also has little hills and valleys along the way to keep the ripple going and not end up sounding too dramatic. This is not Nessun Dorma. This is the boxer. Looking at this, what I call the rainbow shape. Let's start with that and then I'll bring in the other elements that I just mentioned in brief. The rainbow shape is simply my way of explaining what I find in a lot of very satisfying melodic design, where essentially the melody begins kind of low, it arches up, reaches a peak, and then comes gently down the other side, just like a rainbow. Now, as I said, this song does that in the overall shape of the entire verse. But within that, we also have some little hills and valleys. So, for example, um, it starts out kind of low. We're in this range. We go up a little bit. A little valley here. So 
we had a little bit of a rise and a little bit of a descent and we ended up gently down here. That is our first rainbow. Now what happens next is we have this little rainbow that we just heard and then we have a larger rainbow that nests over it in the whole overall view of the verse. And so in that regard, we, we've only gotten halfway through the rainbow and now we're getting to the peak right here. You hear how it's descending gradually, gradually, smoothly down the other side. It comes a little bit lower. And then there's where we settle down to the end of the song. It's really a lovely, satisfying shape. And within that, I can also show you how, what I mean by not big leaps, but simple gradual ascent and descent, stepwise movement, it has to do with the fact that we rarely skip notes or on the harp it's easy to see because if I skip a note, I skip a string. And most of it is just walking neighbor to neighbor to neighbor all the way through the song. A couple places we might hop a little bit, but even that isn't really felt as being something jagged or, or dramatic. This is our biggest peak when we go from such our promises and then all lies and jest. But from this note to this note is an octave. So even though it's a big leap, it's simply the same note, just a pitch higher. I could even go like this, such our promises. And then it wouldn't have that big leap. But then of course we'd end up going lower and lower down to the basement. So that's why we end up starting there. Now I mentioned in passing the idea of it being very much like a folk song, a ballad style in the folk tradition. And I'm going to say some things which I cannot prove, I cannot argue as being guaranteed this is why it happened how it happened. But at the same time, I think that it is valid, and that is that this song, if we think of traditional folk music, we can look at, oh, let's go across the pond, let's go to, to Great Britain, the British Isles, and think about English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh folk music, because that is a very familiar style of song to us here in America. And why is that? It's because a lot of the immigrants as they came to the US brought their traditional folk styles with them. And as, as we know, that is the seed, the origin of what eventually became bluegrass and mountain music style here in the US was that same, same tradition. And of course it became Ameri Americanized and became its own thing. And then of course, within that, the same simple harmonic design exists. So in this song, in The Boxer, we find the same very simple harmony along with the very traditional style melody. So then, in this traditional harmonic structure, we essentially have our one chord, our four chord, our five chord, and throw in a sixth here and there. Now, let me just, since I'm making this link all the way back to the British Isles and the folk music from there, let me just name a few that would be sort of similar. Let's stay, well, there's Bunnison, which is, in this country, known mostly with the lyrics, Morning Has Broken. And if you think of that, you immediately hear the rain rainbow shape that I was talking about as the melody rises and falls. Another one would be, oh, the famous ballad, um, Or Sea to Sky, Speed Bunny Boat, 
like a bird on the wing over the sea to sky. Um, again, that's telling a story. And then we could bring in something else too. But you get the idea. It's all in the same classic folk style. And all of these use classic folk simple harmonies. Why? Because they don't need anything else for one. And for two, they're meant to be sung and they grew up within and they developed within the non-intellectualized, non-high art population. And that's a very good thing because it's the musical expression of the people of the land. And so that's why I feel like it's fair for me to say this is a very American song in the folk style. We could even say that it's an American folk song, except that we know the composer. So <laughs> all that aside, this song is recorded um, in the studio version in the key of B major. So that's what I'm going to be playing with. So here is our tonic chord, our primary chord. That's simply B major. Of course, we could play this in any key, really, but I'm sticking with what the recording has. And if you listen to this melody, you'll hear that that underlying B chord, harmony, supporting harmony, lasts for quite a long time. And then finally we end up on a G minor here, which is the sixth. So we are going from B. We pass through, and I could even play, and then there's a G minor. Now I could actually erase that G minor and make it a B. It wouldn't be quite so interesting, but here's how it would sound like. quite do the same thing. It doesn't quite fit. So really the six is better. Or we could give it the four. That might be another thing that somebody might do if they were just picking it out by ear. It would sound like this. And it works. It doesn't sound so bad. But it's special if we go to the six. And that's what they chose to do, just to give that little bit of a minor coloration, because this is all major. Major chord, major chord, major chord. It could end up sounding too bright and cheery if we just use major chords. And that's why adding the six gives a little special bit of melancholy to it. Going on, that's all we have in the song. We have sometimes an F sharp, which becomes an F sharp seven. That's our five chord, right? And if, if you want to know more about all of these chord terminologies, check out my Coffee and Patreon pages because I'm doing a theory course which explains more about that and will help you to be able to follow this even if you've never played an instrument or had any musical training before. But coming back to this, if this is our one, this is our home chord. This is the chord that is the most powerful counterbalance to home. And it also carries us back and makes us want to return home. And that is essentially, I would say, 85% of the entire song. Once or twice, we have this chord, the four chord, or E major, and that gives a gentle sound. And we hear that when we're coming from Right there, it softens it a bit. Now we're back on the dominant, dominant chord. 
and then we eventually end up right back home. That's the sketch of the entire verse melody. Now, getting a bit further into the harmonies, the second verse and the verses following start expanding on this melody a bit and add a harmony layer. And so instead of just this melody, we hear that melody plus a harmony line. And when we put them together, it sounds absolutely beautiful like this. And you hear how sweet it sounds and it's still smooth but there's a feature I want to point out is that for the most part again this is using the folk style harmonization where we simply travel in parallel both voices one is higher well that's the lower one the higher one is here but they're both going the same direction we don't have a lot of contrary motion voices working against each other or being complicated, one doing one thing, the other doing something else. It's just one flow. And they're both working in tandem towards that same end. For example, right here, when we have... And the other thing that's happening is they're simply outlining the chords. They're not adding a lot of dissonance. It's just there. It's nothing fancy or, or super imaginative. And yet that is what makes it so incredibly sweet and flowing and natural. Now, working within this basic style design, the other ingredient for the magic in this piece is the orchestration and sonic design. Everything I played on the harp, it sounds nice, it sounds good. I could play this entire song on the harp and have a really pleasant cover of the song. You could play it with just guitar accompaniment. You could play, you could sing it a cappella. All of those different things. And it would be absolutely lovely. This is the versatility of a folk song. It works with simple instruments and simple voices. But the recording is something special and it is a work of art. I want to talk a little bit about what I discovered about this recording. Because again, going back to the fact that this is pulled from the music history course that I'm doing with Carl. And he's been telling me about how recording technology and techniques and, and um, all the different things became more sophisticated and really helped rock music and modern music to develop the way it did. This is an example of an incredibly refined, sophisticated recording process with multiple layers. I read that this song took more than 100 hours to record. Portions of it were done everywhere from here in my hometown city of Nashville to New York. Some of it was done in St. Paul's Chapel at Columbia University and, and uh, Simon and Garfunkel talked about how they loved singing in that space. I can tell you, if you sing in a really vaulted church-style space, traditional church-style space, oh, it makes your voice just become an instrument of the building. It's really quite satisfying. Then, of course, another part of it, I guess it was the big drum strikes that that are like the 
the boxer blows were actually recorded in a hallway abutting a, an elevator shaft. And they found that the acoustics there were really great to give the, the power of the sound that they wanted there. It seems they went anywhere they needed to in order to get the sound quality they were after. And in my opinion, it really paid off. I love the organic smoothness of the end product. It's like running your fingers over a fine piece of tapestry, silky smooth, but you feel raised threads that add texture and interest. You can feel the skill that went into the needlework as you trace the lines in that tapestry. And it's just like that in the song. There's the perfect amount of power and grit sound sprinkled around in the form of the bass harmonica that comes and enters in, the brass, the powerful drum blows. It keeps it from becoming too syrupy, too sweet. It doesn't feel like it's just a sappy, sentimental song. It has character and quality, just like the subject of the song, this person, also has a character and quality. He is an individual, and the music conveys that. It's not just in the harmonic and melodic design, it's in the way that the recording was done to balance all these different elements. And it's not just that there's a good balance of it portion-wise, but also where it's placed in the music. For example, where the drum strikes is absolutely, I couldn't think of a better place to put those drum strikes. And then where the voices sing cut and they emphasize the consonants in that moment. I think it's the last verse. The sharpness of it is visceral. It's like it, it is an experience our experience of the experience, the boxer's experience. It's, it's um, something that we feel and the music gives us. As I was listening to this song, I began to think, surely there must be some really great a cappella covers out there because it's the type of music that really works with, as I said, all different kinds of arrangements. So just out of curiosity, I hopped on YouTube and did a quick search. And I didn't find as many as I expected. Well, there are, you know, different high school, college groups, whatever, but not as many professional groups as I expected. Although I have to say I didn't search long. I just did a quick curiosity. Let's see what's out there. But I did find that the King Singers did a cover of it. And I listened to it to see what they did. They really give it some spirit. And I kind of enjoyed the different interpretation, but I guess in this case, I much prefer the original version. But if you're curious like me and want to hear a different take on it, they do some cool things. And here's the link in case you want to check it out because it is kind of fun to hear a different, a different perspective of the song. Do I like it? I guess you can tell that I did like it and I do like it. And it's one that I will end up putting on my playlist. I might even end up making a, an arrangement that works on the harp of it. I enjoy the story. I enjoy the music. I enjoy the execution and interpretive artistry of the recording. And I'm sure that I will enjoy it many times over in the future. I would love to hear how each of you view this song. If you have other things you want to add, let me know and I'll see you soon.